Number one, be assured the gospel will advance. And we're looking at a chapter in the story of the book of Acts, and we're saying, yep, it keeps on going. It could have ended here, at least for Paul and all of his buddies. It could have been like the the gospel goes no further, but it's going to go further because that's what God said would happen. Look at the back of your worksheet. Question number two. I've never had you look, look up so many passages in one discussion question. And at least they're all in the same book and they go in canonical order. But at, at some point, when you sit down to prepare your questions for your small group discussions, or even if your small group's not meeting here in the summer or whatever, please go through these questions and look up all of those passages, which I hope will be an encouragement to you. Because it really is hinging on chapter 1, verse 8, that says that there's going to be this explosion of the gospel, this witness to Christ that's going to move throughout the book of Acts. Now, I take this all the way up through chapter 18, but here we are in chapter 19. And I don't know how I worded it, something about if Alexander or Aristarchus and Gaius could envision this, like, what would they think about this? I mean, what would they think? Well, the riot is very intimidating, it's really scary, but they would think, no, there's a trajectory, a trajectory of the gospel plowing through every barrier up into this point. Of course it's going to go on. Now, the reason I think this sermon is so important for us to hear is if you were here last week, you might have left feeling a little depressed that, you know, that was a doom and gloom sermon, and the walls of culture, and it's so hard, and, it, you know, the riotous mobs, and we're trying to get it in perspective, but because we articulated so much of it, it felt a little bit like, wow, it, it is bad. Matter of fact, some of you don't listen to the news or watch the news, or you don't really keep track of what's going on like others do in our church. I mean, maybe it even it, it, it raised a little bit of awareness of how hard it is in our culture to stand for Christ, and you start listening to podcasts or the news headlines, you think, wow, it's a rough place for us to be Christians. And there's no doubt about that. It is. And there is a pushback, and it's a satanic pushback against the gospel. And it feels like the walls of hell are closing in on the church. And I get all that. But I'm here today to step out of that and say, well, look even what happens next. In verses 35 through 41, what we have here is we have God saying, that's not done yet. And I want to say to you in the 21st century in American church, things are not moving in a trajectory that looks like we got a lot of religious freedom coming up in the next 10 years. But I'll tell you what, God is not done getting his task finished. He's going to do what he promised to do. And that's what we need to remember when we think through some of this particularly because we're part of something much bigger than just a church plant in South Orange County, California. Let me prove that to you by going to Mark chapter 4, verse 30. Let's start there. Jesus tells a parable that reminds us that even our church that we have here planted in in South Orange County, and we planted multiple churches, and we see the growth of it all. As a matter of fact, if you were to look at what I see every week on my report of what's going on, not only at this church, but all the churches we planted, you just see through the continual growth of people. We see the baptism reports. We see people getting saved. We see people coming into the church and worshiping and being a part of it, going through partners. We see all of the expansion of all of this. And I just want to say, this is not just a the compass thing. This is a Christian thing. And, and it's all about people bowing their hearts, so to speak to the lordship of Christ. That's the king, right? The king now is collecting subjects for the kingdom, and we're a part of this, right, on the other side of the planet 2,000 years later. And I just want to think about it in terms of what Jesus says as he illustrates it in verse 30. Mark chapter 4, verse 30, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable, what story can we use for it? How can we illustrate it? Well, verse 31, It's like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the ground, is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. That's, I mean, in terms of what they planted back then, that was the smallest of all what they would ever use. Yet, when it is grown, when it's sown, rather, and it grows up, it it becomes larger than all the garden plants, and it puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make its nests in its shade. So here's the picture of the kingdom. God is going to send out the tentacles of the message of the gospel And that message as it's proclaimed is Christ is lifted up, right? Not only on a cross, but in people's minds as we lift him up in the message of the gospel as being a crucified Christ that paid for your sins. It's going to call all people, attract people to it, and they're going to find their home in the kingdom of God. And the tentacles have expanded not only around the world now that we sit on the other side of the planet from Israel, but it's gone through time, and the branches have come here, and you little birds with me, bird brain, we've all come and found our nest in the kingdom of God. Christ is Lord to us. Christ is our king. Christ is the, is, is the leader of our lives. 
And, and that to us, right, is where we have found our home. We found our home not just in a social sense, sense, but in a soteriological sense. We are saved because we've put our trust in Christ, we've made our home in the kingdom, and one day we will inherit the kingdom. But the branches have gone out around the world, right? Kind of the inverse of my story of the roots, right? This is above ground, the picture of all of these branches going out and all the birds all over the place, of all kinds coming in, Jew and Gentile, in our case, largely Gentile on the other side of the planet, we're finding our place in the Christian family. That's good, but it's going to end. Matter of fact, we talk about this from 2 Peter chapter 3, but just look up one paragraph and look at what precedes this. A story in verse 26 about the kingdom, and same idea about growth, growth taking place in the ground, and something coming to fruition. And when it does, it ends. Verse 26, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps, he rises night and day, he goes in waters, he tills it and cultivates it. The seed sprouts and it grows. And he knows not how, right? He's not a botanist. He doesn't, he doesn't know exactly how this is working, but he knows how to farm. He knows how to water it. The earth produces by itself, right? He's not down under the ground pushing it up. It's, it's coming out by itself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once it puts in the sickle. Uh, he puts in the sickle, rather, because the harvest has come. So he's going to come and harvest it all, which, by the way, when you see that picture of harvesting, that's a picture Jesus uses repeatedly to describe the end of time. The end of time, there's going to be a, a harvesting. He's going to take the tares and put them into the furnace and take the, the wheat and put that into the barn, into the kingdom of God, and so we're going to separate, much like the parable of the shepherd who separates the people like a, sh like a shepherd separates sheep from goats. That's the idea of the end of time. It's going to grow until it's ready to be harvested. And the harvest of the coming of Christ is going to end this thing. And the picture of the growth of the church, you just need to know, has a terminus in God's mind. He is growing this, to put it in terms of the current age, until the fullness of Gentiles comes in, to quote Romans. The idea of the message of the gospel going out until every last person appointed to eternal life, to use the words of the book of Acts, is saved, well, then that's when the harvest is. That's when the trumpet of God is sounded and the dead in Christ rise and the church is caught up to meet the Lord in the air and the picture of the harvest is done. So I'm just saying, if that's the terminus, if that's the goal, if the goal is if I go away and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself that where I am you may be also. If that's the promise, I'm going to come back. If the disciples asked in Acts 1, is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, not for you to know the time. Just go be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. To quote Acts 1. If that's the promise, but then he's going to come back. As the angels there said, just like so as you see, saw him go, you're going to see him come back. So if the coming back is based on the fact that the tree is going to spread its tentacles out around the world until the last bird lands in the nest of the kingdom of God, and then we're done then I know this, that God knows exactly what he's doing. Everything's right on schedule. And the tentacles of the gospel through the growth of the church and Christians around the world, even in places where it looks like there's not much going on, North Korea, China, Saudi Arabia, whatever you think of in terms of a non-Christian culture, even in our culture, even if our church was to be outlawed, even if we were to go underground, even if we were to lose our status before the government as a 501c3, you know, a church in our country. Listen, here's the deal. God's going to do his work and he's going to accomplish it. And you need to be confident in that. Just like the first 18 chapters of Acts made it clear. You don't doubt it in chapter 19 when there's riots against Christians. And you don't doubt it now when everything in our culture seems to be pitted against Christians. When we're getting attacked like we, like we haven't ever before in our country, certainly in the last 100 years, we're, we're experiencing a kind of opposition that a lot of us get depressed about. And I'm saying don't get depressed about it. Because here's the thing, you're on a team that ends up winning. And every last person gets into the kingdom that God has appointed to eternal life, we just keep at it. We're excited about the fact that God is going to do his work. I will build my church, right? Not you guys will build my church. It's not like a coach. Sometimes we can picture Christ on the sidelines as the coach. He's the, he's the best college football coach ever, right? But sometimes he might have a lousy set of recruits. He might have a lousy set of, maybe for a few years, he had no good players. So maybe he's going to have a losing season every now and then. It's not how it works with Christ. Right, Christ is the perfect head coach, 
but he's also sent his spirit onto the field where every single ligament, every tendon, every muscle fiber of every player is animated by the triune God. He gets his job done. And in this case, we see everything that was wanting to snuff out the Apostle Paul and his companions, we see it all retracted, at least for a time. At least the door is cracked open for him to get into chapter 20 and have the book of Acts continue. And I'm here to tell you, God is going to do that in our, in our culture and in our country, even in crazy, liberal, anti-Christian California, God is going to get it done. We're going to keep on working and keep on moving, and the branches are going to continue to grow, and people are going to continue to get saved until the times of the Gentiles are filled, and the buzzer goes off, and the harvest comes. By the way, did you know of anyone this last year that was converted to Artemis? because that's what they were all afraid of in the first century. They were all shouting for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. If you feel like, you know, the liberal anti-Christian mob is winning because everyone agrees with them, I just want to know what became of Artemis, right? You, you want to you see the glory of Artemis? Go to London Go to the British Museum. You have to go to the basement, room 77 of the display on the Greco-Roman culture. You'll find a little display about Artemis. There's also some in room 22. You have to get your map out, but you'll get there. But you know what you won't find there? Many people bowing down to Artemis and saying, I want to be a follower of Artemis. You see a lot of people getting dragged through the museum, getting bored about that point after these all the big displays. Now they're looking at some old statues of Artemis. Or if you want to go to, to uh, Ephesus on one of our footsteps of Paul trip, you'll get there, and if you want to see the great seven, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, as I said, you'll see one column that they've stacked up because it was all busted in the You've got one column of the huge, impressive, you just know, everyone knows about, we are the keepers of the goddess of Artemis. It, it's not, no, no one's excited about going to church around that one pillar. And yet, what's happening with Christian? You know anybody in the last year that's been converted to Christ? Well, if you've been coming to this church, you, you do. You see them get up on this platform every few months and give their testimonies, and they talk about coming to faith in Christ. <laughs> Artemis, someone burned the temple down at one point, and they did rebuild it, and then there was a flood, and they were like, oh, forget it. But when it came to the church, right, I just want you to know what happened to the church in Ephesus. The church continued to grow. Right? This is mid-50s in the first century. So in the middle of the first century, uh, it ends up that Paul drops off Titus here and makes him the senior preaching pastor of this church, and it continues to thrive. The apostle John shows up, and, and most people would surmise that because he was entrusted with the mother of Jesus, that Mary went with him. And, and as the, the assumption goes, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, buried there, died there. John was there. And then he got exiled to an island that's 50 miles off the coast of Ephesus there at a place called Patmos. He wrote the last book of the Bible after he wrote the epistles from Ephesus, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, Paul was writing scripture from this, this city. He was writing scripture back to this city, certainly when he was writing the pastoral epistles to Timothy, the pastor of the church. Oh, I know, you've read what John wrote on the island of Patmos, which was Jesus sending a message to Ephesus, you've left your first love, repent, right? Well, they did repent. And the church began to thrive and thrive and thrive and thrive, so much so that by the fourth century, when Chrysostom was, was preaching in, in, in what has become Constantinople, um, or what became Constantinople, now is Istanbul, uh, guess, what, guess what he spoke of the church of Ephesus being? A thriving church, a church that had, and here's what he estimated, 100,000 Christians worshiping with the church at Ephesus. So as, as Artemis continued to decline, the church continued to advance. Now, I can't say that's going to happen for our country, but I can say that's going to happen for the kingdom of God, whether it's here and we just get a little part of the big picture of, of the birds coming in the nest of the kingdom, or whether it becomes some you know, continued growth in other places where the majority of, of growth to the church is there, but we're going to see the growth of the church because God's going to get his job done. And that's what we need to be confident in. Uh, Artemis is just an artifact at this point. Christ is still ruling and reigning over hearts just like he did, increasingly so in Ephesus. Well, how did he get it done? Well, he protected his church in a very unique way. 
Back to our passage, Acts chapter 19, verse 35. And when the town clerk, and I told you, this is the liaison between Rome and Ephesus. I just want you to see these, these words and just emphasize this, drilling down another level of God getting his work done. How does he get it done? He has to deal with the opponents. The town clerk quieted the crowd, verse 35. Bottom of verse 41, and he dismissed the assembly. So all of this in his speech ends up having these people go home so that the uproar ceases, chapter 20, verse 1, and then Paul goes on with his business. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't a terrible season of time for the Christians in Ephesus as all of this is going on in the riot, but I am saying this. God enlists a town clerk, and the town clerk ends up quieting the crowd, and when he's done, dismisses the crowd, and things move on. God is going to protect his project, which is another way to say what we've been saying, but let me have you write it down that way.